cat. <laughs> that is true. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of used to it at this point, but yes, I, I totally hear you. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for joining in and finding the link. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Sometimes it's the small wins in our day that we need to celebrate. So we are super excited to have this session. Um, what I want to remind you though is if you want to ask questions throughout, because I don't, if you're anything like me, I will forget to the end. So if you have questions that pop up throughout, make sure you use the Q&A feature that is in Zoom. We will make sure we see that question and bring it up at the end during our Q&A segment. So I'm very excited to introduce you all to Claudia Contreras Gomez. She is an executive director with Lenovo. And just a little bit on her, she believes that collaboration, taking pride in your work, and always looking for the value add are critical to driving a high performance culture. Through both her experiences and her entrepreneurial spirit, she has been uniquely positioned to spearhead transformational initiatives such as Nemo, where she supports new and expecting mothers at Lenovo. I love that, which totally makes sense because she is a working mom of three kids herself. So Claudia, take it away with connecting with a purpose. Thank you. Thanks for that. I am going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully you all be able to see that. Um, Oh, sorry, I think I'm not doing this right. Here we go. Can you all see my screen? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. All right, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be among so many strong, ambitious women. You're here today because you decided to be groundbreakers. You're the ones taking on the challenge of leadership and making things happen for yourself as business owners. So hats off to you and thank you for having me in the next few minutes. Um, my goal for us today is simply to share some insights, let's say like nuggets of information or learnings that I've caught along the way. I've been working for corporations, large and small around the world in about, about 20 years now. And I'll pause there because um, I know you're doing the math. I can't see your face, but I know you're doing the math. I'll have you know I joined, um, I started working at the age of 12. That's my story and I am sticking to it. So um, a bit of a, a bit about me. Um, I, I'll start off with a personal story. I spent most of my childhood in my hometown of San Francisco, California. My family and I lived in one of those old Victorian houses, you know, the kind that survived the big earthquake and the, the creek. They really have no closets and and we call them houses with character. Um, but you know, for us kids at the time, my two siblings and I, um, it was prime property. I mean, this place was great. We lived across the street from Presida Park, which you see on the screen. This was a really nice playground. Um, as you can imagine, my siblings and I, we, we practically lived there. It was super fun and we have so many really good memories of it. But one of the things um, that I do remember very vividly is that you know, we were masters at every piece of equipment, the way it was intended to be used, and also all the dangerous variations of how it wasn't supposed to be used. As, as kids, we also knew like who were the regulars that were visiting the park, the, the people that would be there pretty often or the ones that would just come by on special occasions. One day, I was, I was probably about 10 um, when this random kid comes up to me and and he says, hey, um, your sister's about to get into a fight. And I thought, oh my goodness. So yeah, um, truth be told, this was not something normal for us. This was, this was not something scrawny kids like us used to do. Um, we were definitely not the tough fighting type, if you know what I mean. So this whole situation, it was not good. Being the eldest, I really had no choice but to get involved. So here I make myself, uh, you know, as brave as I possibly can. I run over and sure enough, I get there. And Loopy, my younger sister, is face to face with this girl. They're having this face off or whatever. Um, nothing more than really a screaming match at the moment, but you knew that that was not gonna last. So, you know, I, I was desperate. I was desperate for a way out, a way of avoiding something like this because, 
this uh, the real fight would have just been a losing proposition for us. So I decided, well, I'm going to try something new. And I, I actually tried diplomacy, believe it or not. In my limited 10-year-old way, I calmly went up to this girl. I looked her in the eye, changed my tone of voice. I remember all of this. And I spoke to her. Like, I looked at her. I acknowledged the situation. I let her know that I understood why she was mad and that, yeah, my sister sometimes would do things. Um, I even told her that I recognized her from other times that she had been at the park and reminded her that we had played tag together a few times and that, you know, maybe we could play again. So if she called this off, then maybe we could be friends. Then like, without breaking on eye contact, you know, we were just kind of standing there. I sort of paused and I just kind of let her speak up. Almost immediately, immediately her face changed. It was like, like I had given her a pass or something. She looked at me and she battled some other stuff. I can't really remember. And then she just said, okay. And she backed off. Just like that, it was over. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was like some crazy Jedi mind trick that was going on and, and it worked. Um, but you know, we all know as adults in retrospect that that was no trick. My 10 year old self at the moment was able to influence this little stranger because I had really made her feel seen. I acknowledged her and I took her seriously. So from that moment on, you can imagine, I was hooked. I knew this, you know, at this age, I knew this was money. I mean, this was good stuff. And if I tried real hard, I could probably repeat it. Not always for good causes, but I knew that this was possible. Regardless of the type of product, the reality is businesses are run by people. These people have feelings, they have biases, everybody's got their own egos and expectations, and will most certainly have different communication styles than maybe what you and I would have. So all of that is going to affect the way that a message is received or even the way it's given. Our ability to persuade these living, breathing people beyond just giving them cold, hard facts or throwing numbers at them is, is critical if we really want their support. Getting across to that, that human element could be the difference between you closing a sale or not, um, getting that investment or not, or even just to get somebody to work with you or not beat up your sister. You know, I've learned that this power of persuasion can be heavily dependent on just your ability to connect. And, oh, sorry about that. Um, and um, so I don't mean connection in the network type of way or the chemistry that you get like from a first date or something like that. I'm, I'm talking about the, the direct, clear communication that happens when you fully engage someone and, and you, you see them and they see you right back. There's a multitude of books about this subject, like effective communication and, and ways that you can persuade people or influence others. But I, I really want to focus on just four critical things that I always turn back to when I need to go and find support or reach out to others for that support. So I'll, I'll work through these in the next few minutes and you know we can, we can save the end for questions or if there's some comments or sharings that you would also need to, would want to share. First one, you need to know your audience. And I'm going to call it audience, but you can call it customer, you can call it the person who's on the other end. Whose support or share of wallet are you trying to win over? What are these people like? And realistically speaking, what biases do you need to consider when you're approaching them? What maybe they're, what are they used to? You need to know all of these things to really formulate your approach and, and, and be able to be effective when you're communicating. Getting to know who your audience is and what makes them tick, but prior to actually asking them for something, that should always be your goal. Sometimes you find your audience or your customers or 
eager to give you controls, for example, um, they might just, maybe they just want you to solve something for them. I'll, I'll give you an example of something that, you know, just happened recently. My vice president, she wanted us to be at the top of our game when we supported our customers. She wanted that support anytime, anywhere, whenever our customers needed it. She doesn't want to know how we enabled 24 by 7 support, for example. She doesn't really care how many workshops we have to hold or how we design shift distributions, how much we pay, all of that stuff. She just needs to know that it gets done. My HR partner, on the other hand, or maybe even my finance person, they absolutely want to know. They're interested in the details because those things matter to them. Being attentive to these differences will make it a whole lot easier to gain trust from people. And you absolutely, absolutely want to gain trust. The next thing you need to ask yourself, which is probably the most important thing of all, is what is your customer actually buying from you? You think you know what you're selling, but are they really, really the same things? Take me for instance. Prior to COVID, every few weeks, I used to drive down about 30 minutes each way um, to Holly Springs. I would go see my hairdresser and you know get my hair colored and just you know do whatever needed to be done to keep it up. Um, between the drive and the service, I'd say there was it's about a three hour ordeal, roughly. And you know I I have a very demanding job. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I've got two teens who do all sorts of sports, and now I even have a ten month old baby boy. Um, I also enjoy eating and sleeping once in a while, you know, taking showers, that kind of thing. So like many of you, I'm, I'm a busy person. Three hours of my day is not really so easy to come by. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this, I make time for it. I, I, I really make time for it. One motivation really is, yes, you know, I don't want to see the grays. I don't want to be, I, I, you know, I just want it to look like it's kept up. But the real reason I'm willing to pay, spend the time, the time I don't have, because this is my treat. Like it's, it's that little luxury I give myself every few weeks. You know, I, I sit there, I get my hair washed and you know, read mindlessly all sorts of garbage I don't need to know. Um, and and, and you know, while I'm sitting there, nobody's asking me for anything. I'm just, I'm just there. Maybe I'll get asked how warm is the water or something like that, which I will easily and very happily respond to. I mean, I, I love it. I love it. I even enjoy the car ride home. It's such, I'm such a good mood. I'm in such a good mood that, you know, I'm, I'm all alone. Nobody's asking me to change the station. So I'm blasting NPR or listening to my audio book. And, and I realize when I say that out loud, it sounds kind of lame, but you know, I'm just cool like that. Um, but anyway, so if I was offered the opportunity for that same kind of service, so getting my hair cut and get every, everything done in say the comfort of my own home, because I obviously need to save time, you know, would I take it? No way. I mean, of course not, of course not. Because what would the fun in that be? So reality is, I am paying for a haircut. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. But what I'm really buying is the experience of getting one. As you think through how you market your own product or service, make sure you put yourself in your customer's shoes. Peel back the onion as best you can to understand what really motivates them and how you can solve for that. Number two, mold your message. When making the ask, be sure you adapt your message based off of what needs to be heard and the type of collaboration you wanna get back. Um, do you, like, are you thinking about informing? Um, do you want to just express an opinion or are you really asking for something? You've gotta be very clear on your intentions because if your intention is to inform, 
don't go asking questions about people's opinion and opening yourself up to, to do's that maybe, maybe you're not even willing or able to go execute. If your intention is to express an opinion, be mindful. Um, potential sensitivities in your audience on the topic. Maybe like if you're thinking about calling somebody's project ugly, first and foremost, make sure the person's maybe not there or be willing to be associated with everything you just expressed. Now, if you're looking for support, which is many of the times that's why we, we go to people, be very clear with what, why, and how that support needs to come. At work or at home, I often get issues coming to me that I need to go solve for. Normally, I am not the smartest person in the room. I, I make it a point to surround myself with people who are. And I, I gotta tell you, nine, nine times out of 10, it's the person who, who brings me the issue or that was knowledgeable enough to detect it that is really the best source for providing a solution because they have that perspective. I say often or not, and the more you can leverage that, leverage others. And in your message, give others that opening, allow for that to happen. Well, you always wanna be in command of your business and what happens all the time. You may benefit from not overpowering the conversation. When you make your issue our problem to address or our solution to implement, the buy-in from others just multiplies. You know, you, you say things like, what do you recommend? Um, can we map it out together? I, I, I do this pretty often. Here's a pen. Show me. Draw it out. If this is the only thing that's missing, then, you know, do we have it right? Are we done? You think about being the enable, the enabler. Foster situations that are gonna allow for contribution and all of that will end up giving you more advocates than what you started with. So remember, always mold your message. Number three, delivering the message. This is really when rubber meets the road. You know who you're targeting, you have the right message, and now you need to go deliver. The first thing to decide is really the communication style and the format you want to use. This will be especially true when you're thinking about promotional messaging or some of the like mass marketing. We'll, we'll speak to that in a minute. Um, you know, like when you when you think about targeting moms, for example, you probably want to think of saying staying clear of like lengthy PowerPoint presentations that might work well in a finance organization or like staying away from maybe evenings or a, a time when it's busy, busy time, getting dinner on the table or putting kids to bed. On the other hand, a late evening presentation followed by some cocktails might be exactly what you wanna do if you're targeting maybe a younger single crowd. You might wanna use text as a quick and effective way to get certain groups. Maybe quick reminders or light promos. You know, this is, a, this is an easy way to get your message across, and it, but it does fall into something a little less personal. Nevertheless, it's quick, it's cheap, and it's practical. But when you are in person, you may wanna rely on something a little more visual or tangible as a reference. It doesn't have to be like this fancy PowerPoint, um, it could be a flyer, a sample, just something, something that you can point to. It, it, it's not always applicable, but in many cases, just having something on hand to show is a sign of preparedness, especially, especially if you customize things for somebody, you know, have their name or, or a quote rip, written up on letterhead, something to show that you made an effort. You took them seriously enough that you, you were ready. And honestly, it, it doesn't take much. Maybe, you know, just, just having, making sure that you have consistency with your message and the way that you're showing it, that's what you really should be considering. Now, when you are in person or even virtually to an extent, you do have a very unique opportunity for connection. 
especially when working in smaller forums. You know, the ideal is smaller forums in person, face to face. Because having someone face to face not only heightens your ability to read into their reactions, it also allows for you to put on display your own passions and confidence in, in yourself and your business. And confidence that goes a long, long way. Early on in my career, I had a team lead um, who to this day, I still reference as somewhat of a model for confidence. English was not her first or native language by far. She had a very heavy accent, you know, and, and, I, and I'm being nice about it. Sometimes we would find it very difficult to even understand her. Yet, you know, she would, she would go up there, she would stand tall, hand on her hip, and in a very matter of fact kind of way, she would hold her own in any forum. You respected her. You didn't critique her because she commanded that respect. She wasn't asking for forgiveness for her accent or the words that she was incorrectly stating or using. She was there because she had a job to do and, she, and you knew it, you knew it. So that level of confidence is something to strive for. 65% of everything that we communicate is nonverbal. Your body language says more about you than possibly the words that are coming out of your mouth. If you wanna portray confidence as an example, you know, you, you stand tall, you make yourself larger, you open up, you want to avoid the whole the, the slouching or the, the looking small. There's a whole host of tips and guidance about how to interpret body language. And if you haven't done so already, I highly, highly recommend you put yourself through that. Look at yourself from a different perspective and, and understand your tendencies. It, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, it's, it's, it's intimidating. Um, as my kids would call it, it's cringy. Because when you're looking at yourself through that lens and you're critiquing, you, you learn a lot about yourself and things that you, you hoped that wouldn't be you, but it's well worth it. And I can't stress enough the importance of looking people in the eye, using like your whole face to show emotions and allowing yourself to express your thoughts with potentially movement, you know, not this rigid approach, then you just sort of stay there with no movement. Because when you use it appropriately, I do think it is a game changer. Um, well, I think by now you won't be surprised that, um, that you know, I can get a bit animated at times. I am very much Latina. I use my hands to speak and my face backs it up and you know, I move around. These wrinkles here are there for a reason. Um, but you know, I, I often have to keep myself in check though. I, I, I do, I I'll, you know, put my hands underneath my legs sometimes just to, to stop myself when I feel like I'm getting, you know, it's a little too much. But depending on my audience, I do, I, I do mold that and I do tend to tone it down a bit depending on, you know, what, what the message I wanna portray. I have to be mindful of it. I know I do. And there isn't a right or wrong here. The point is, you just have to be aware and knowing and being aware of yourself and your habits is the first step. Now, I want you to take a look at this guy on the screen. I'm gonna ask you a loaded question. Does he look trustworthy? He certainly is smiling and seems pretty confident. You know, he's, he's standing up straight, he's got a full smile and all, but does he look like he would be good at his job? I'm asking you to make a judgment call. At first glance, you know, when I look at him, yeah, sure, probably. Um, but now, what if I told you that he was here to remove your appendix? Dr. Tom here will be operating on you in the next few minutes. So buckle up. Not too confident on his abilities now, are you? But why is that? Would you prefer to have the woman on the right, for example? Yeah, most would. We're all used to certain things and many times pass judgment solely off of what we see. And on top of that, we all have biases. You know, these predetermined ideas of how things should work, why they would work, 
it, it, it's all part of human nature. It, it's normal. Because what we see and the impressions we get just from sight, they absolutely cause an impact. I'm not saying that you need to put on a costume just to look a certain way. Once again, you know, that's not it. It's just being mindful of how you are perceived in the eyes of others. Many times you do want to look the part. As shallow as that sounds, because even saying it sounds like it, we can't deny that our appearance is the first thing we communicate. But what about your voice? Intonation, speed, pitch, the way you articulate your words or how you create effect with the way you use pauses or silence. Using a lower voice, perhaps in matters that are a bit more serious, a higher pitch for something that may be a little more upbeat. You know, it, it, all, it all blends, it all has to mold together. Back in college, I had an English language professor who had lived with arthritis her whole life. I mean, this woman, she was, she was tiny. And, you know, although she was still able to stand and walk a few steps here and there, her arms and neck and practically her whole torso had very limited movement. But honestly, that meant nothing with her abilities to use her face and her voice. And wow, could she use her voice. I mean, she would project it across the room, adjusting her volume and creating twists and turns in the flow of her words. It, quite frankly, it was captivating. I could only strive for something like that. But you know, in our new virtual world, these abilities are even more useful. So it does, it does take time, it does take effort, but you know, voice, do not dismiss it as something so powerful. Oh, and, and one other thing. Um, the other thing that you don't necessarily need to see, but you can hear is when you're smiling. Like when you're, you're talking, the, the words that, the, as you're saying the words, you can detect when somebody's smiling. So don't underestimate that. So as my doctor used to say, if it has wet feet, it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. And keeping on the duck theme, that brings us to my last point. Bring your whole self. It's easy to get caught up with, a, with fitting the mold or doing what needs to be done. As a woman, as women, I think we, we tend to aim for perfection a little bit more. We usually will adjust, we'll tweak, and it's really easy to get caught up in the process. Being self-critical is fair and it's a learning experience, but don't let it hold you back. Don't allow for that inner critic to dominate your thoughts and everything you do throughout your day. I very often need to remind myself that what makes me unique are the things people will remember. It's those, those attributes that make me different that are really gonna stick. So don't suppress them, own them, use them to your advantage. For the longest time, I was very self-conscious about um, a malformation I have on my leg. I lived with it since birth. Um, as a kid, I had a substantial limp and would often need to wear those special shoes, you know, the, the bulky orthopedic type, they're not very flattering, they were ugly. And at the time, my parents were told that, you know, I was, I was this unique case. I, there had only been one other case like me and recorded U.S. history the past 50 years. Great. You know, and throughout most of my childhood and definitely my teen years, I would try and hide it and dismiss even talking about it or acknowledging it. I hated being seen as weak. But what was so evident to others was exhausting for me because I wasn't controlling the narrative. It was others talking about it, but me not addressing it until I did. You know, I wasn't really, I didn't do it voluntarily really. 
it was sort of forced. Um, you, you can't really hide years of surgeries and devices, crutches and all that kind of thing. But after that initial discomfort, it becomes liberating. It, it wasn't a thing anymore. And in fact, now I, it's a conversation starter. I wear shorts and you know, it's okay. Giving others sometimes a glimpse of me as a person opens up doors for stronger relationships. Most definitely does. One of my favorite TED Talks is one by Brene Brown. Um, it's called The Power of Vulnerability. If you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend that you do. Um, she describes vulnerability as the birthplace of love and connection. And, you know, putting yourself out there, being authentic, and letting yourself be seen is the first step in making these true connections. So I would say to you, and this is my call to action, harness your uniqueness. Let yourself be seen and see others. Because from where I'm standing, all of you, all of you, the only thing you're really missing is a cape. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. I love it. That was so, so, so good. I love all the imagery. I love your stories. And I mean, I could talk about communication styles and personality styles all day. So um, thank you so much, Claudia, for sharing just so much of you and so much of your knowledge and expertise in this. Um, remember, if you have questions, because I'm, I'm sure many of you do, please put them in the Q&A and I'll kick it off with one. Actually, I was thinking about when you were talking about um, perceptions and you know the way we look, the way we talk, the way we dress, those kind of things. In your experience, especially leading a team of people, working with a lot of people, what do you do when someone is maybe um, misperceived or uh, maybe that first impression didn't come off so great or maybe they haven't been taught some of these things? What would you say are some words of wisdom in that kind of situation where um, maybe it does affect communication in the team or how people look at them? Because you know it's tough when people have already kind of made their mind up about somebody how do you shift that perception moving forward? Oh, absolutely, and 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 it does happen. Um, what I would say first and foremost, you don't you don't call people out on the spot. It's usually you know you take them aside, and and there has to be some willingness on both sides. You you know you don't always not everybody wants to hear the feedback, but if you do have that kind of relationship and you do intend to you you have good intentions and you they may be open to it, you definitely pull them aside and sort of make them aware. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that this is a problem that person has. It's a problem that maybe we all have with the way that we perceive and those biases that we hold. But the fact is that it does affect um, the outcome. So it's just having, making sure that the person knows that this may be going on and more than anything, respecting sensitivities around it. Cause it, it's hard to hear. It is hard to hear. Yeah, sure. I definitely can uh, agree with that, especially, um, when so much of this last year has been virtual, right? We, we don't necessarily get all those signals that we would normally get to, right. or, um, how much more has been through email or text or whatever, and how quick are we to be like, what do they mean by that? You know, and without actually calling it out or asking specifically, um, there's a lot that has to do with miscommunication and, and misperception and then workplace drama and, you know, the snowball, the snowball effect happens. Right. All right. We just had a question pop in. Let's see. From Nathaniel, with virtual being so prominent right now, looking people in the eyes is very difficult. Good point, Nathaniel. Since when looking them in the eyes, you're looking at the camera instead of their face. How do you get around this awkwardness? Oh, like today? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wish I could give you some, some secret way of doing it. I, I, I can't. Um, I find myself avoiding the, like looking at the image. You know how when you, you're on the Zoom that your, your picture pops up? I do not like to look at myself. I try and focus on the, the person who's actually popping up on the screen and not make it a point not to see myself. Um, just some practical things that I do, I, I have two monitors and I'll put one of the monitors on top and I sort of move the, move, 
move the screen so my face is hidden so I cannot look at myself. And that sort of gets me around to not doing this whole thing when you know, you're kind of looking in the corner to see your face. Um, it, is, it is harder, it is harder. Um, I would say that the best way to do this or for what's worked for me is that I'm purposeful with trying to make that, that connection and looking at the, the little dot that shows you that this is the camera and I'm speaking to you. You know, I, you have to make a conscious effort because you're right, you don't get the feedback the same way that you would if you were um, face to face. And, but, but cameras do help, you, know, do, you do see other people, it's just not the same, the type of cues you receive as you're, you know, as you're talking to someone face to face. I love that. And I'm maybe going to blow somebody's mind right now, but I cannot take credit because somebody taught me and Claudia, this may be exciting for you. If you want to follow what Claudia was first saying about trying not to look at yourself, because we all got kind of get caught up in that, right? Like you jump on Zoom and everybody's like, oh, my hair is like, what is happening? So in the three dots in the corner of your screen, if you click on it, like in your personal box, um, if you click on it, there's an option that says hide self view, which actually takes you off of your screen just for yourself. Okay. So that you can just focus on who's in front of you instead of worrying about yourself or what you look like or, or that kind of thing. Now, don't forget you are still on camera, <laughs> but if that helps anyone, that's a little trick that you can do that I have done that, that really does because it, it, it just kind of changes the the look of things and the way your the information your brain is taking in and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's a All good right. one. I didn't know that. I didn't either until somebody taught me. So passing on the knowledge. All right. Any other questions that we have? I think we have an extra minute or so. Or any other last thoughts that you might have, Claudia? No, I mean I'm I'm just I'm thankful. You I think this group entrepreneurial women I mean how strong and how powerful is that so hats off to you and thank you for having me yeah I, I agree I'm looking at um, a lot of the the names on the participant list recognizing quite a few of them as very very strong leaders very strong women really um, making an impact but that'll that'll just have a ripple effect for I mean generations legacies changing in so many fun and powerful ways so with that, again, Claudia, thank you so much for your time. Very much appreciate you all, um, or your energy and your time for today. If anybody has questions, her profile and contact information is in the platform. You can reach out to her, connect with her, ask her any follow-up questions, because I know sometimes people process things a little bit differently and might need a little bit more time. So feel free to reach out to her. Um, but again, thank you, Claudia, for your time. For everybody else, we are gonna have another short intermission. And for our next, segment, there is going to be another link that will be again in your platform. So make sure you are jumping onto that link at 2.30. All right. Thanks so much. We'll see you all in a bit. Thank you.